today. And so um, the name of the, of the 27th reading of the, of the Parsha is Tazria. And it means she conceived. Now the name is derived from the words of Leviticus 12, 2, where the Lord said to Moses, when a woman conceives and bears a male child, and so Leviticus 12 discusses the laws of purification after childbirth. Leviticus 13 introduces the laws for diagnosing and quarantining lepers. Now, except in the, in the biblical calendar leap years, Tazria is also read together with the Torah portion, the subsequent Torah portion, Metzorah. And so, uh, and that's, you know, you read both of those together. This Parsha is only two chapters long, and then the, uh, the Metzorah is only in, uh, two or three chapters long. So that's why next week we'll go on to, um, to um, Metzorah, because we're in a leap year. Remember, we had two Adar, two months of Adar. This week and uh, next week, we'll be discussing what is translated as leprosy. However, the Hebrew word sa'arat is not what we call leprosy or Hansen's disease today. Biblical leprosy can be diagnosed from a variety of skin conditions that are not necessary, necessarily related to one another. Furthermore, biblical lep leprosy can appear as mildew in a fabric or uh, in leather, and uh, it might appear as mold or mildew on interior walls. How about that? Now, I don't know if any of you have ever had uh, leather or uh, something that you've stored away in a damp spot someplace that or you didn't know you'd stored it away, it had fallen over behind something, and then you find it, and it's got yucky on it. All right, well, that's, uh, that could be considered biblical sarat, okay? And um, I know I've got out in my shop, I've got a big uh, leather belt thing that uh, um, I will use sometimes uh, if I'm going to be lifting something very heavy so that I don't... Uh, um, you know, get my back out of whack or something like that. It's a, that's a belt. It's about this wide, you know, and you put it around you and everything. Well, I hang it up out there in, the, in my shop. Well, the shop is not, you know, it's not terribly t climate controlled. It's dry, but it's, uh, and guess what? It gets little cooties on it. And so I have to wipe it, out, wipe it down, you know, spray it with some Lysol and, uh, you know, just because I, I don't want it to get ruined. So that's, uh, that's another a thing of Sarat. Now, there's a common misunderstanding about the laws of biblical leprosy because lepers were quarantined and put out of the camp or out of the city. Modern readers assume that the, uh, the Torah intended to stop the spread of a communicable disease. All right? So that is not the case. There is no indication that biblical leprosy was communicable. Commentators are not even sure it was a naturally occurring affliction. Hmm. Although, you know, I would say that uh, on mildew, uh, mildew on fabric and leather, pretty much natural, you know. Um, some believe that it was a supernatural disease. Now, the Torah uh, quarantines lepers because they are ritually unfit, and their unfitness is communicable. Okay, did you get that? It's not the leprosy itself. It's the business of being in an unfit state or an unclean state, tahor, uh, and uh, clean being tamai. And so there's, there's two different things. And it has nothing, being clean or unclean has nothing to do with sin. It's having sin in your life or whatever. It, uh, it has nothing to do with that. Okay, so biblical leprosy is a ritual purity issue. That explains why it's discussed in the middle of the book of, Le of Leviticus. Biblical leprosy makes a person with the disease ritually unfit. The biblical leper is also contaminating to other people and things. Contact with someone afflicted with biblical leprosy transmits the unfitness, not the leprosy, okay? Now remember that Yeshua touched 
and healed a leper at one point? Well, that made him ritually unfit. Now, did that mean that he was a sinner? No, not at all. It just made him ritually unfit until the point, and he could not go into the temple at that point until he had spent the requisite seven days away and then gone through a mikvah and, and uh, he maybe even gone to a, uh, a priest or something, that uh, Cohen, and said, okay, I've, I've uh, touched a leper and now I am wanting to be back ritually fit. And you also remember that uh, and he was coming out of uh, Jericho right the, the week or two before his crucifixion he came up on the ten lepers. He didn't touch them. Why? Because he was going to the temple in a day or two. And he, he, could, he could heal them. And in fact, he did just with his word. But he didn't touch them because had he touched them, he would have been ritually unfit. He could not go into the temple. And so there was a reason that he, that he did those, those things. He had to go through all of the, you know, he wouldn't have had time to go through all of that to, to be in the timetable for Passover and all that. So, traditional opinion does not regard biblical leprosy as a normal disease. Instead, the rabbis thought it uh, of as maybe it was a divine punishment. Now, the idea does have some biblical support because uh, in Numbers 12.10, uh, Miriam, the, the uh, sister of Moses, was punished with leprosy for speaking, deris, derifis, uh, speaking bad <laughs> derisively against Moses. She was bad-mouthing her brother is what it was amounting to, okay? Second Chronicles 26.20 tells how King Uzziah was punished with leprosy for defying the Torah by offering incense in the temple. 2 Kings 5.27 tells how Elisha's servant Gehazi was smitten with leprosy for taking money from Naaman. Based on these passages, the rabbis believe that biblical leprosy was an affliction for specific sins. This may not have always been the case. The Torah does not indicate that leprosy is a divine punishment for, uh, for specific sins. So, a person could get leprosy. They could get skin diseases or whatever. It does, did not necessarily mean that they had sinned, a particular sin. But sometimes there, a particular sin was, uh, was greeted with leprosy. Okay? So that's, uh, it's kind of like in today's world where something bad happens to good people and some sanctimonious rascal will say, if you just had enough faith... Or if you had just not, you know, if you, you, you were not faithful to the church or you're not, you know, whatever, um, then, uh, then you would not have had that. You know, we were, we were visited with that kind of foolishness uh, when our first child died. And people said, well, uh, it told Pat, it said, if you'd had enough faith, God could have saved that baby. And, uh, you know, she, man, it destroyed her. And uh, so that, that kind of stuff is, is bad news bears. You don't, you don't say that because it's not true. It's just not true. So um, that was off of my notes, so I've got to find where I'm at now. So the rabbis considered uh, leprosy, uh, biblical leprosy, they kind of narrowed it down. And that primarily to the, the punishment for the sin of evil speech. Okay. Now, the Hebrew word for evil speech is lashon hara, okay? And um, it literally means evil tongue. And uh, um, the uh, uh, lashon there, that, that the, the word there, lashon, some they say it, it means tongue, and then I saw another definition that uh, says that that, it, uh, that word lashon is, uh, could mean lips, you know, just... The, the part of speech there. And so that would make it kind of interesting for those Pentecostals who speak in lips <laughs> instead of speaking in tongues. Doesn't it? Okay. The association between evil speech and leprosy is derived from the story of Miriam's leprosy. Miriam was punished with leprosy for grumbling about her brother Moses. 
Based on this story, the rabbis often use the passages as preaching material to speak about the sin of uh, Lashon Hara. Yeshua and Paul made a similar connection between evil speech and biblical leprosy. Biblical leprosy creates ritual unfitness. Yeshua declared evil speech to be a source of spiritual unfitness. He said, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and that's what defiles a man. That's in Matthew 15, 18. Paul made a direct connection between evil speech and skin affliction. He said, worldly and empty chatter will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will sp spread like gangrene. That's in 2 Timothy 2, 16. Now, how do I identify it uh, physically? Biblical leprosy usually began with a small spot or a blemish on the skin, but it quickly spread across the whole body. Evil speech is kind of similar. It can start with a simple, most in, almost innocent remark, but it quickly grows into a demeaning and destructive torrent of derision. The ritual unfitness created by biblical leprosy was so strong that a that it could pass from person to person. Simply being in the same room with a leper was enough to contaminate you. Gossip is the same way. Just being around a gossip is dangerous. Once evil speech is launched, it, it passes from one person to another faster than the flames of a forest fire burning through a dry forest. James, the brother of, of, of the master, compares it to a forest fire lit by the flames of hell. He said in his, uh, his book, James 3, uh, 5, to see how a small fire sets ablaze so great a forest. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a world of evil placed among our body parts. It pollutes the whole body and sets on fire the course of life and is set on fire by Gehenna. For many species of beasts and birds and reptiles and sea creatures is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Now, I have been in situations, I got in, in uh, many years ago, I happened to be visiting another command when I was in the Coast Guard, and they started talking trash talk about some uh, ladies in my own command. And I didn't start the conversation. I didn't participate in the conversation, but I was a senior officer in that room. And so it got back to my commanding officer that I was, you know, talking bad about these ladies. My error, my mistake in that, you know, I was in someone else's wardroom, the officer's place where, you know, where officers eat. I was a guest in that place, and so I was not the senior officer in that, in that uh, set, in that place. But I should have said something. I should have put a stop to it. And I, you know, I had said something, uh, but... It was not the. It was not uh, strong enough, and it was not uh, decisive enough that um, this lieutenant, you know, was not listening to a commander. Is what it amounted to, you know, and and so he just kept rambling on because that's the kind of guy he was. But I got in trouble for it. Why? Because of that that tongue, you know, and it, and it's okay. I was. I didn't say anything, but I was there, and I didn't stop it. So. Before we go too far into this lesson, I want to assure you that everything that I'm teaching today, I had a nice Christmassy um, Yeshua born on this day lesson, and uh, Monday night, I didn't sleep much, because I said, no, we're going to talk about Lashon Hara. Okay. In fact, so... As I was studying for this lesson, the Holy Spirit was doing a real good job of pointing out where I had failed in so many ways. That, that episode back many years ago in the Coast Guard was one. I, uh, I often let my alligator mouth overload my hummingbird rear end, you know, and that's, um, it's gotten me in trouble lots of times. Why are the ways we talk and the things that we say such a big deal? 
Maybe it has something to do with the fact that the universe was made out of words. Do you ever think about that? God spoke and the world came into being. He just spoke it into being from nothing. He didn't take anything. He just created it out of nothing. The power of speech is the power to create. With our words, we create our own realities. I think I've already uh, talked to you or said something about uh, the idea, you know, when you see that little deal that says, it is what it is. I used to have a boss that would say that all the time. You know, it is what it is, meaning that, you know, you can't change it. But there is a corollary to that, that, you know, it is what it is. It will be what you make of it. And sometimes our words can, can uh, make it all the difference. Speech has an amazing effect on the world around us. For example, compare two families. In the first family is a man who routinely speaks positive and encouraging words to his wife and his children. In the second family is a man who routinely speaks negative and hurtful words to his wife and children. One family flourishes and another family languishes, all from the power of words. Proverbs 11:29 in the in the Message Bible is a different uh, different translation than we normally use. It says exploit or abuse your family and end up with a fistful of air. Common sense tells you it's stupid. It's a stupid way to live. Hmm. Do you ever feel like that your life is out of control? It could be a sign that maybe your tongue is out of control. Uh, James, the brother of Yeshua, says we're like ships and our tongues are like rudders. We're like horses and our tongues are like the bit and the bridle. It's the tongues that steer our lives. James 3, 5, it says, and it puts bits in the mouth of horses to make them obey us. We got our whole body as well. See how the ships, though they're so large, they are driven by strong winds. They are steered by a very small rudder wherever, you, uh, wherever the, the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. If you've ever seen ships in dry dock, you'd be amazed at how small that little rudder is. You know, I've got a 25-foot sailboat, 25 feet, and the rudder is only this wide. And that, that steers, that steers the, uh, the boat. And I mean, it'll turn on a dime. It, it steers that boat. Big tankers that are 900 feet to 1,200 feet long, and the, uh, the rudder is only going to be just a fraction of that. It, uh, that. That rudder may only be 30 or 40 feet long out of, you know, three or four football fields. Rudder is a powerful thing. If we allow ourselves to speak out, the ne out of the negative the evil and the cynical, every time we encounter it, we will experience a negative, cynical, and evil world. If we compel ourselves to, to find the good in people, situations and problems, and force ourselves to speak the good, declaring blessing instead of cursing, we will see our world transformed. Everyone around us will be transformed by that positive energy. Have you ever seen someone who is, they're just... Um, they well, sometimes you know you say well they're Pollyanna, you know they uh, that they're always going to say good stuff and see good stuff and you go oh that's disgusting can't they ever see be real, you know and uh, but I would rather be around that person than the one who sees everything in a negative light, you know that nothing is right and everything is wrong you know uh, wouldn't you? Everyone around us would be transformed by how we speak. With our tongues, we can build or destroy. We can mend or tear. We can fix it or break it. The tongue is the means by which we draw the holiness of heaven down to earth. We're able to build with blessings. Our tongues are also the means by which we can create a self-imposed hell on earth. You can. Many believers use their tongues to damage the kingdom of heaven. We damage our communities and we damage our own souls. It's a, it's, a, it's a big deal. It's a far bigger deal than you think of. Um, so what is, what is evil speech? How do we define it? Evil speech is the opposite of love. That's just you know, plain and simple. 
Peter said that love covers a multitude of sin. There's an, another way of saying that <coughs> love puts up with imperfections. How about that? Love puts up with imperfections. Now, um, a loving person intentionally looks the other way and ignores the weaknesses of others. I've been around people that uh, are very adept at pointing out the flaws in other people's personalities. Um, I was you know, just thinking back to a, a time where there was a fellow in, in the office where I worked, and he was one of these kind that was constantly, you know, he was, he was the Don Rickles of Diamond Offshore. You know, I mean, he was always uh, putting people down, trying to build himself up, I guess, something like that. And uh, um, he happened one day to, we had a man who was dying of cancer and was doing his very best to stay on the job until the final uh, breath. And uh, he looked very bad. You know, and, and with all of the, his problems and everything, um, he had shrunken from his once robust self down to nothingness, and, and he was just wearing a set of coveralls instead of regular clothes because it was easier for him to carry all the bags and everything that were on him. You know, just gross. And um, this fellow looked at the cancer guy and said something about him looking like uh, Tommy Turtle. Because, you know, he was, he was bowed over and he was, by this time, lost all of his hair. He was, you know, he, you know it, was, it was pathetic. That made me so mad. I jumped up out of my seat. I was going to go uh, do a uh, Will Smith on him. <laughs> and my boss knew exactly what I, what I was going. He grabbed my, my uh, arm and uh, just said, not now. <laughs> and so... Okay, so uh, I probably saved my job that day by not doing a Will Smith on that guy. But it just so enraged me that someone would say something bad about a fella who was dying of cancer. You know, even if he wasn't dying of cancer, and yeah, yes, he did. He couldn't look like Tommy Turtle in, a, in his shell because he was, you know, that's just, it was, he was afflicted by that time. But you don't say stuff like that. Evil speech is just, uh, you know, it's the opposite of loving. The speaker of evil delights in pointing out character flaws or defen deficiencies in others. And so, you know, I just told you that story about the, the guy that I was working around. This week I was reading some excerpts from a writing, the writings of Rabbi Israel Mayer Kagan. And he's better known as the Chafetz Chaim He's famous in Judaism today. I know, I read weird stuff. But he's famous in Judaism today for his classic books about proper speech. He defines Lashon Hara as... Lashon Hara, or evil speech, is defined as information which is either derogatory or potentially harmful to another individual. A derogatory statement about someone is Lashon Hara, even if it will definitely not cause that person any harm, to focus on the shortcomings of another person is in itself wrong. A statement that could potentially bring harm to someone, be it financial, physical, physiological, or other, otherwise, is Lashon Hara, even if the information is not negative. Even true statements which are derogatory or harmful are Lashon Hara. Because so, the, so there's no loophole there. You can't go around and say, well, everything that I said about them was true. It doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's kind of like uh, um, you know, 1 Corinthians 16, 6, 9, and 10. Paul puts slanders, you know, the gossipers, that sort of thing. Uh, in the same grouping as the sexually immoral and idolaters. He said, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. The sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, those who practice homosexuality, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, slanders, swindlers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. Take that, Disneyland. So even if we say 
true stuff about somebody, if it's derogatory, if it's harmful, it's, it's Lashon Hara. It's an evil, evil speaking. And, you know, I've, I've been in situations where, yeah, uh, you talk, and everybody does it, I think. You talk about people sometimes, and, you know, you may not, you may not intend to cause harm as such, but, you know, let's face it, some people are just downright funny, you know, <laughs> and so, yeah, uh, and, uh, you know, it's just easy to fall into that. Today, we've explored a, a possible date for the birth of the Messiah and the implications of illness stemming from our language. Yeshua said that the two greatest commandments were to love God with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, I can truthfully say that in the writing of the sermon, I have had to repent of Lashon Hara. I had to do that. I mean, sometimes, uh, and quite often, when someone uh, delivers a, a, a drosh or a sermon, it's because they, you know, happen to be looking in the mirror. And if you can't look in the mirror, you know, then a person has no business being up here. Sometimes without thinking of the consequences, I've said things that were not profitable for the congregation or for maybe that person. And for that, really, I'm, I'm truly sorry. Sometimes my, my glib attempts at humor end up being hurtful, and for that, I'm sorry. I mean, I can remember years ago, where this, there's this little old lady in the congregation, and uh, um, I think I'm older than that little old lady is now, but I mean, so uh, than she was then. But she had missed several services, and so I finally went up there. I went, she showed up, and I went up there to her, and she was sitting around, you know, sitting right in the midst of all of her other little old lady friends, you know, and and uh, <clears throat> so I said uh, to her. I said, I am so glad to see you uh, back. I said, uh, uh, now that uh, the uh, wrestling champions, uh, championships are over, I figure, you know, I see that you're back and, and not watching wrestling on TV. And uh, all of her little friends, they just laughed and giggled. They thought that was the funniest thing. Little did I know that I had offended that lady so badly. I hurt her feelings. You know, like my, my granddaughter told me, said, uh, you have hurt me deep, we, you know? And uh, uh, so um, that's, uh, uh, you just say things sometimes that you, you really don't have any idea that uh, you've, you've done it. But it's just not good business to do that sort of thing. And uh, so you have to be careful. Some people are, are more sensitive to others. And she, you know, she was sensitive. Uh, she had recently lost her husband. And, uh, you know, I just was trying to, Make her laugh a little bit. Boy, did I do the opposite. So you know what I had to do? I had to apologize, repent of that, and just go, you know, over and over again as to how I did not mean to offend that lady. You have to do things like that. So this morning, I would like each of us to, you know, in our own ways, reflect on our speech. <clears throat> Take a Take a, uh, an inventory of the things that you say. You know, a lot of times we, uh, we talk and, and some of the words that we use uh, are not helpful. Not, uh, they're, they're hurtful to people, so, but they're not, um, you know, every, every, the Bible says that every idle word that we say is recorded and it'll, it'll come back at us, you know? And so are you speaking good? I think of uh, Tori, uh, Tori Corey Tim Boom. I'll get it right in a minute. Corey Tim Boom. That lady was, to me, it was a champion of speaking good about people, if you've ever read any of her writings. And uh, so she was, uh, if you don't know who she is, she was a lady who uh, uh, their, their family were hiding Jewish people in the Netherlands during World War II. They got caught and they got sent to... Uh, um, concentration camps where all of her family, except I believe her sister, were killed. And then eventually her sister died too. So she was the only survivor out of, out of the family. And uh, then even 
after all of that, she would not speak evil of people. My grandfather was that way. He would not speak evil of people. That, and so it was a good example in my early life because I, I saw and watched uh, you know, a couple of times where uh, somebody had said something about one of his granddaughters and uh, you know that person deserved a Will Smith right there. <laughs> but my grandfather just uh, kind of gave him the look and the guy shriveled. And my grandfather was an old coot by that time. I mean, he couldn't have done anything. He was old, and you know, he had to have he had to have help getting out of the uh, out of the chair, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, but he was not going to speak evil of somebody. He just let him know that that kind of language was not right. And uh, we can do a, sometimes. Yesterday, a guy we, I've been having truck uh, truck troubles. And so finally they said that, oh, we got it fixed this time. And uh, I didn't say anything. I just looked at him and I said, okay, well, I hope so. And then the manager came out and says, can I speak to you outside? <laughs> so we went outside and he says, um, you didn't say anything. And I said, no, because once I've said it, I can't unsay it. You know, he says, yeah, but uh, he says, your eyes betrayed you. And uh, I said, well, I can't help that. And he said, well, yeah, but uh, he said, it hasn't been a good experience. And I said, you're right. So anyway, you know, it's just that, that idea of just don't say it sometimes. And just, uh, I'm in the, in the category all the time here, you know, sort of, sort of stuff. And so I just say, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to say anything about that, about that person or about this or that. Or that. I will observe and if there's a problem, I will deal with it. But don't expect me to jump on every little thing, okay? I'm just not that person. I'm a lot slower, okay? <laughs> the older I get, the slower I get. I think it's a good practice. If we re reflect on our, our language and what we're saying, what we do, if we can do that, we will have a much, much better congregation. And the world will know that we are believers in the Messiah by what? Our love. Okay? That's how they know that we are his disciples is that we, uh, we love each other. So... Could we stand and we will close in a word of prayer? David? Oh, my. They are coming from the dead, I believe. Oh, my word. Yes. Okay. Get your cameras out. Get your, I'm, I'm going to get mine out. I don't want to miss this. Guarantee ya. I had forgotten about that. Okay. But here we are. They're, they're coming in and... <laughs> All right. Are you going to grab a camera on that one, Terrence, if you can? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't know how they're making it, to tell you the truth. Oh, boy, it's going to be tense. It's going to be tense. Uh. The story was Lazarus, okay. So... <laughs> okay, here we go. Come on in, all you Lazarus. <laughs> okay, how about that? All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> good, good. Uh, we don't have one. 
No. no. Okay, is everybody back to the, I mean, they're, they're kind of close back to their seats again. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> All right, for those of you, if you're, if you're visiting with us, you know that uh, you're not, you may not know, we gather under a tallit with our families and as a way of saying we're under the covering of the Lord. And uh, so we'll close out with the ironic benediction. Ibreka kara naiv ishma reka ya er adonai panave leka vihu neka isa adonai panave leka vayasem lecha shalom. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord shine the light of His face on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance on you and give you his peace, his shalom. Amen.